Ladies and gents, welcome to our talk with the Club Commission after the pandemic, unmasking club culture for the post-pandemic world. So here I have Robin Schellenberg and Daniel Plush. Welcome. Uh, so Robin is the co-founder of Klunke Kranich and United We Stream. He's also an artist on labels like Stilvor Talents, Kademuka, and Ein Musica. And he's also a board member of the Berlin Club Commission. And Daniel here is a manager at the newly opened RSO Berlin, formerly called Griesmühle. He was also the founder of the club Stadtbad in Wedding. Also a co-founder of United We Stream and a board member of the Berlin Club, Berlin Club Commission. So, ladies and gents, warm welcome for these two. Thank you. Thank you. So, can you tell us uh, more or less what the Berlin Club Commission does? <laughs> we are a regional lobby for club culture, and uh, we are founded. We were founded 20 years ago. I think we are one of the oldest. Uh, lobbies um, for club culture worldwide and I think we are uh, the biggest regional club culture lobby in Europe or the world I don't know yeah pretty much actually in, in, in the world and um, we are as well um, basically independent because we are not um, part of the city structure or administration and um, we are basically funded through members and um, yeah, so, but uh, old structures. All right, so it how did it? A little fun fact, it was basically founded because of uh, the raids in the 90s that happened in the clubs and um, then people were kind of like uh, getting together and um, thinking about how can we stop this? And so they started talking to the police and this uh, little organization of people basically then came up with a idea of um, yeah starting a yeah basically the club commission and in the very beginning it was um, you know it was not okay to call it a lobby because it was a bad word <laughs> and now we freely sit here openly say the word that we are a lobby organization for clubs because it basically is exactly that okay great so what was the importance of the uh, the commission during the pandemic um, I think it was really big because lots of people were faced with different situations than before and they needed help to get some funding, for example, what we call Kurzarbeitergeld, where you get, uh, where you get money to hold your staff um, so they don't uh, get fucked by the pandemic and uh, still have money to solve their lives. And uh, we have this, the thing that we never got something like Kurzarbeitergeld in Germany as a, uh, as a club or um, as a gastronomic um, uh, venue, so it was really, really new for everybody. So, the club commission is always kind of an informational hub for all their members and help everybody to get uh, like all the information they need and to get the funding they need and to keep the information flowing. So, I think it was really important, uh, and this was like kind of a momentum where you saw how important it is to have this uh, lobby organization where all the clubs are working together to save and help club culture. Cool. Also, the subsidies that were, you know, the helps that were um, flowing from the government into all kinds of uh, companies and organizations, um, a lot of them, you know, clubs would fall through the cracks. And it was very important from um, our colleagues to actually speak uh, to administration and the government in order to um, have, you know, the clubs be part of it and to be eligible for the helps in the first place. So how often do the, the members of the commission get together and discuss current issues? Um, we are organized as like we have the board and we have a monthly board meeting where we talk to each other about everything like what happens now and the programs we have and such. But we also have like working groups who meet in uh, different um, moments, like also mostly between four and eight weeks. And we have, for example, working groups for festivals, for like spaces, um, which is led by, by Daniel, uh, or also for staff now, which was founded by me, uh, because we had the problem or we saw the problem that more and more clubs are searching for good stuff and it's not, not easy to, to find them because lots of people lost, uh, lots of people um, left the branch because of uh, less safetyness. You saw, you don't know if you have a job in a club, you don't know if the club is opening again, when it's opening again, when it's shut down again because of pandemic reasons. 
Um, so we always try to focus on problems we see and then try to solve them and make uh, information accessible. So for example, the working group of staff, we have like around, I think, 70 club people who do the staff planning for 70 clubs. It's around 60 people. Um, in a little network and they meet every four to six weeks and talk about how the club is going, how the people are uh, getting, how the shifts are getting filled, what's the problems and also what's the fears, for example, like the, the check for when you, when you have like received two years of Kurzarbeitergeld, it's in a bigger club, if you have, if you have like 50, 60, 80, 100 uh, staff people around, it's getting more and more money you get from the state, so after the time they will check this if you made it properly and uh, so a lot of people are like feared that they have to pay back a lot of money because maybe they made some faults. So we organize together and find the problems and then find solutions. Uh, so no club will be forced to shut down or pay a lot of money back. So this is kind of things we do. Okay. Um, what were some of the fears that were surrounding the whole situation with clubs during the pandemic and which ones have kind of dissolved, which ones still remain as we're kind of getting out of the pandemic now? Um, yeah, well, obviously, everybody was um, fearing for their own existence uh, because it was existential. Um, it was the clubs that were shut down um, as the first places, basically, and it was pretty clear in the first days of the pandemic and the lockdown that uh, the clubs will also be the last ones to actually reopen. So for everybody that um, kind of knows or, that, or n yeah, knows about um, the dynamic of a pandemic, knew that it's not just going to be for a few weeks. So it was pretty fast, pretty clear that um, we're in for something bigger and for something very challenging. And um, obviously, if you have a full stop of an industry for two years, you just don't know what it looks like after. And um, now we see how like it unwinds after um, this event and how difficult it is in so many in so many ways and so many challenges that you didn't really think of. And you know, because it is a complex matter and two years is is a long time in a way. And um, it has brought a lot of issues to, to, to light. And um, I think, um, yeah, um, to, to, to say it with the words of a, of a, uh, uh, of a, of a Taiwanese um, DJ, he said, it is way too early to speak of, about a post-pandemic world yet. And yeah, I, I do agree on that. Any, anything else you want to add to that? Um, it was for, for me. It was interesting to see how we, in the, with the work of the club commission, we could um, gain visibility um, for all the politicians because we like we were we were a lot. We are giving jobs to the people. We are giving joy. We are also giving jobs to artists. And I think we are core part of the identity and DNA of Berlin. And I think what the people who founded the Club Commission worked like 20 years for is like the visibility and also the access to the people and the funding and the money. And I think without the Club Commission in Berlin, um, lots, of, lots of clubs didn't receive, would not have received the money they got because we made it like in talks to the politicians that we need the money, that we are part of the city. It's really important to keep us alive. Um, and I think we, um, yeah, made something good out of this crazy situation and, and focused on how important the scene is. And we got seen by it and the people gave us money. There was, for example, this uh, Support Hilfe 4 program, uh, which was kind of a liquidity program. If you couldn't pay any, any money anymore to, your, to the people who wrote your bills. And it was like qu quite a fast, easy tool to get money to um, live all the situation through and to go, don't go uh, bankrupt. So what about uh, other logistical issues that may have happened during the pandemic, like any supply chain issues? I know that was kind of, an, uh, kind of a thing within the clubs themselves, um, and also when it came to gear, like getting some repair parts that you needed, or uh, if you want to throw a festival. <laughs> so anything like that that affected, uh, or that, that, that people who are going to clubs and festivals might be affected by? Um, I mean, uh, f probably the people that are going to the festivals won't be affected by it, but um, we certainly are. Um, we have um, we have ordered uh, CDJs three thousands 
in March and we still don't have a delivery date yet. That means we have to rent equipment every, for every party and that obviously also puts pressure on your liquidity. And um, it is also uh, repair is an issue. Um, our mixers, obviously, you know, in the club environment, um, these like uh, sensitive um, uh, technical, um, you know, um, devices, they do have, um, you know, they, they do break. And, um, and the parts, the spare parts are, you know, like you don't, you don't really have them and the few that are around, obviously the uh, companies keep to uh, fix their own rental um, equipment. So that is also an issue, things that you wouldn't even really think about, but um, things like this um, we are dealing with and a general kind of like shortage on, on, on devices. You always find them, of course, but um, you will certainly also have to pay for them. I just have a broken CDJ and um, <laughs> I found, I asked my repair company and they said, I don't know when the, when the parts are arriving. Um, now my partner found a company in LA who has the uh, repair parts and he called them and they said, we won't give it to you because it, we need it for our clubs. <laughs> so it's like really, uh, I think it's a, it's a worldwide problem now. We see now more and more the problems of the supply chain, which is like a highly, um, highly constructed a system where like when one, one part falls down, like the whole chain gets uh, in tumbling. And uh, we, don't, we don't know what, what is happening next. I heard last week that, um, like two, three weeks ago, first time I heard from my supplier for drinks, we have a tequila problem. Now I heard we will have a whiskey problem. Um, we heard about like when you want to do a festival, you won't get a nice PA, you won't get nice CDJs. You have artists, but you don't have staff and mostly no tequila and then you don't have whiskey. And <laughs> in the end, where's the party? <laughs> Uh, when you don't have like the technique to play the music and to bring the music to the to the ears of the people, so I think we will see some uh, developments in the next months or also years, which which will where you as Daniel said, where you then just will see how big the problem is. So it's not not already completely outfolded, um, and we don't know where it goes. Hmm. And uh, on top of it, actually, according to resident advisor data, data there is uh, an increase of 66% uh, of electronic music festivals happening in comparison to 2019. So you also have a lot, uh, a lot more uh, stakeholders. Um, you know, if you have if you have 100 festivals fighting over 120 available guests, that obviously, um, you know causes uh, uh, some some di some some unwished dynamics yeah that's really interesting i was just like on monday on a conference in bavaria and we were talking about that um, like for example whose festival is already sold out and no one like made this and said i'm sold out which was i think when i was in 2019 i had this i had the feeling like how many festivals can grow now and still be sold out everybody was sold out every do like ticket lotteries like fusion and something and now he said like one of the older guys who founded livecom which is like the german uh, like a german um kind of club commission, but also like for live business and such. And he said like the Bayreuther Musikfestspiele, for example, uh, event which is sold out for the last 20 years, like in months or sometimes years before, he said they're still having like, I think 30% of the tickets. Um, and the question is now why? Why are the people not coming? Is it because people realize that they don't need every week a club visit? If they don't need every week a concert? Um, we don't know. It's just thinking about it, um, looking at the small data packets we have. Um, but it's like more or less just thinking about it. Where are we going? What's the reasons? And then try to adapt with it. So it's still we will see where it goes. And it's also it could be that people are still kind of apprehensive about being out with the pandemic not fully having subsided. Um, yeah, I um, actually this morning um, I listened to um, the radio station, the German public broadcast service and um, they were interviewing a few people in um, in a park in, in, in Hamburg and the, the people literally said well going out partying I, I feel misplaced and I don't feel you know I, feel, I don't feel comfortable and they couldn't really pinpoint it what exactly it is it didn't really sound like you know oh I you know I don't want to catch COVID uh, it sounded more like hmm 
this concept is not really familiar at the moment. You know, it's like two years, as I said uh, in the beginning, is a long time. And uh, if you think about it, there's people that, um, that are also important for our club culture that are, you know, the, the, I wouldn't say the next generation, but it is the new people coming, you know, they turn 18 and then they go into a club. Now they're 21 and they haven't seen a club from the inside. So this, um, this concept of clubbing is, is not really so familiar to them. And, you know, so they don't really know what they're missing out on. And, um, and getting them into the places is, is just, you know, it's, it's going to be an extra challenge. And then there's obviously a lot of people that kind of stopped clubbing because it's like, you know, I can also have a glass of wine and listen to jazz or, you know. <laughs> Um, whatever people uh, like doing and enjoying, um, apart from going into clubs on a weekend. Um, and yeah, so I, I, I do think we are, you know, we haven't seen the end of it. And uh, one of the most um, successful parties in uh, Amsterdam just uh, canceled a breakfast club. And um, also festivals like, you know, like festivals with a tradition in, in the UK are canceling. It's like with with big headliners, agencies are, um, you know, having uh, having to deal with cancellations of also big uh, headlining artists, and it's they have never seen this before. That actually ticket sales are just so slow, and obviously at some point you just gotta pull the um, you know emergency break because otherwise you're just gonna end up in in, in a debacle, in a financial debacle, and also like other festivals have already. Um, you know, um, have already uh, filed for bankruptcy. And this, you know, is obviously what a lot of people try to avoid, but it's, it's really difficult at the moment. And on top, then you have the situation, for example, then as a festival, you sold your tickets in 2019. Now you're going, now you're doing the festival, but you sold them while you had lower prices for everything. So now you can't tell them like, okay, you had a festival ticket for 2019, but we have to recharge 40, 50, 60 euro on top because everything got pricier. And uh, from like the founder of, of Livecom, he said um, what he saw a lot is, uh, for example, uh, in, in Hamburg, uh, the, the punk scene, uh, because he heard that most of the punk concerts are not sold out. And he was like, okay, um, It's like, it's like the history of a punk that he's really aware of the money he has. So he realized I can listen to loud music at home and drink beer, which is way cheaper. So why should I go out? Or like what you told about like 18, 18 year old people who turned now 21. Um, I talked about uh, this topic with the younger people, um, with someone who was 18. And uh, she said like, um, I'm talking to people who went, who, uh, who were 16 when the pandemic kicked in. They are now um, becoming 18, maybe 19, and they don't know how this system works. They talk to them about their, the festival they want to go, and uh, she told them that you can volunteer there. And they were like, how, how should or can I? Yeah, of course, it's, it's depending on volunteers. And they were like, okay, wow, I didn't know that. So um, she needs to educate them how the system works because there was like two years, no events happening. Everything what happened was different and on, in this, in, like on this edge of the pandemic. Uh, and now it's getting coming back. And so I think we have to re-educate, tell them like what's the magic of the night, you know? That's like what I heard about like the helpers of festivals. Normally you have like, for example, like 200 helpers and they tell all their friends that it was really nice to be there to help this, to help this create. Um, and this is also kind of a promotion you don't have if the festival is not happening. So it's like also like to remember how beautiful moments in the night can be and how beautiful people you can meet and beautiful ideas you can think and talk about. I think this is also, this also stopped and people forget it. So we have to talk about it, to bring it to life again. We have to, yeah, we have to stand again and um, like to make all those scenes um, like visible and livable again. Yeah, and um, it's a complex challenge because um, prices have increased. Uh, we are, you know, we are facing um, a significant inflation. So we have to drive up the ticket prices and um, artist fees are not uh, getting cheaper either. Um, production costs, staff costs, um, obviously, you know, drinks, just everything and anything you buy is getting more expensive. And um, so how do, you, how do you give incentive to, to the guests 
to the potential new guests? Like, how do you make them want to come? You know, like you you have to increase the ticket price. So they're like, oh, this is also expensive. I don't even know what to expect. Is this really worth it? And 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 having you know having people to actually um, to you know to engage and and really say like, yeah, sure, I'm going out. You know, like 20 euros easy. And um, so this is also a challenge, you know, you, you already have a lower demand due to um, uncertainties in the scene. And then, um, then you're still dealing with the higher prices and the higher price structure. So this is really something that um, in, in my team is, um, is the reason for a lot of like, you know, idea sharing and, and discussions, what to do, you know, like how do you, do you have like a pre-sale with lower tickets? And then at the door, try to kind of like, you know, lift it or like, you know, things like this. And even even pre-sale, like for a lot of people, this wasn't really a concept. But um, now it is really um, like it has become really important for people to kind of like see and, and have, a, have another parameter to kind of like see, do I have to make additional, you know, advertisement marketing uh, for my event because I'm it's not popular enough. Things like this, so like the, the pandemic definitely has changed the behavior of um, of, of promoters on one end and uh, clients or guests on the other. And then you have second or third order problems, for example, like um, when you charge now at a club night 25 euro in Berlin, it's way far away from the, the from the core values we have, like inclusivity. So it's like accessible for people who also have not so much money. Um, And I was like playing last weekend in Copenhagen and there was like an event which was an underground event off location played with like two really big InnoVision artists. And um, I was, uh, someone told me it's like 56 euro entrance fee. And I was like, what? Okay, and then, then, then I was there and I was seeing all those people who can afford 56 euro entrance fee for a party which lasts eight hours. And there were like those Instagram people, everybody's <laughs> like doing that and such. And then I saw some black, um, black, um, Uh, pull over people in, in, on the side, but looking really different, raving really different than those rich people with the Instagrams in their, in their hands. And then the, um, the um, organizer told me, it's like, we, we as a little scene in Copenhagen, we can't afford those artists. They, we have to pay them like seven, eight thousand euros for a two hour set. So now we take like 56 euro because then we can fulfill our guest list with our friends because for 10 euro, you can't afford to book those artists. And it's also like people are trying to, but it's, I think it's getting heavier and heavier and it's really important that we still face the inclusivity, for example, and all the values we developed over the last 30 years inside the electronic music scene. Uh, because I think this is like the core system where we are raving on, you know? Yeah, absolutely. But about for artists, how, have, how has the landscape changed for artists as far as you know, artists who were artists before the pandemic, you know, new artists coming on the scene, or just in general, how has the pandemic uh, changed the way artists go about being artists? Um, well, I think there's, um, I mean, there's a, there's a new species. It, it hasn't really, it hasn't really um, arrived with the pandemic, but it was certainly a catalyst, you know, kind of like the social media or Instagram DJ. And um, there's the, the Instagram techno and, um, I'm, I'm sure people are familiar with uh, that concept. So, um, but social media, media was the only outlet um, during the pandemic, as well as YouTube, which is also a social uh, media platform uh, in a sense. So there was a lot of artists that if you really go back on their Instagram profile um, to like two years ago before the pandemic, uh, they would just like, you know, tell you that they have been going to About Blank or Trezor or whatever and then started DJing during the pandemic. And suddenly you see him in like, you know, playing alongside headline, headliners and, uh, and literally being, uh, uh, being on a bill at Berghain. And you were kind of like, okay, where did that come from? Uh, and, you know, and then people that have been, you know, building music, that have been, you know, giving so much into the scene um, that uh, are now struggling because They don't really know uh, the, the Instagram game as well, or they do know it, but they're, they're not just not so fond of it and uh, don't like using it as much. And uh, so there is certainly a change. And, um, and artists that 
already had a you know a struggling uh, career potentially uh, might have actually looked for a different job now and uh, I was just um, talking with my wife this morning that a lot of the older uh, generation from Detroit for example they just don't seem to appear in European lineups at the moment and some might have actually decided to you know maybe yeah step back from gigging as much and um so there is a there is a shift it's you can you can certainly um see that there is the lineups do look different uh, in in only these two years i mean it is still kind of like the same concept of all the big festivals have the same names but the names are very different and um that is certainly something um that is yeah uh, noticeable Yeah, I think also um, if you are like a headliner, headliner, then it's quite easy to stay uh, on uh, on the run. And um, okay, then for example, you said okay, I play not for ten or five thousand euros while the pandemic. I play for a thousand maybe, and um, fees went down and down. And all the new promoters were used to like, for example, I can get Anja Schneider for around eight hundred bucks. And uh, then then all the people who just Uh, came up to the 500,000, 1,500 range, where now, like, why should I pay for you 1,000 euros when I can have a headliner for around 700 playing while the pandemic? Because they wanted to play, they wanted to have the exposure. Um, maybe they had the money, like, that they can do it, because they have have it in the in the back. But um, all the people who just, like, became the, the small headliners or, like, the support acts for the big ones, I think those are, like, having... Uh, having the struggle for the next years and um, I think this is like really yeah it's it's tough because I, I had it um, a friend of mine was playing while the pandemic for a low fee because it was like uh, like not much happening and he just wanted to go outside in the world and to see something um, and when he was booked again from the same promoter one year later now when everything opens up the promoter was like why do you want to charge now 1,500 euros why and he was like because this is my normal fee And it was like, you won't pay it anymore. So, um, And on the other hand, you see some agency, for example, where you, where you think like uh, people who just were paid 500 euro before the pandemic, they now added a zero and say like, I want to pay for 5,000. So it's like really, sometimes it's like a fee gambling, I think. And um, you don't know when Daniel, for example, says like you have those Instagram DJs, they were partying before the pandemic. Now they are playing at Berghain. Um, Maybe some, some people lost track and you don't know who's like hot anymore now. You don't have all those exposures because of the clubs. Um, the exposure is inside the internet. So yeah, what's, like where, what's the parameters where you say this one is making my party full? You know? Yeah, like it's uh, actually to identify this like first class headliner got a little bit uh, more difficult um, or a little bit more complex because you have to um, add in a few more factors. And um, yeah, it's, it has changed, not necessarily for the bad, you know, because also a lot of um, uh, cool talents um, actually um, broke through because of having this kind of like even exposure of, you know, the internet being, you know, more or less uh, uh, treating everybody the same that um, does, does make the effort. And it's not necessarily an agency that or, or a management that has push, pushed for somebody. So it also had its, uh, definitely it's good, um, but uh, generally it is, um, you know, I mean, we're open for only two, two, two months now. Like I actually looked at the calendar and I couldn't believe it. I was like, it feels like half a year already, so much has happened, but um, there's a lot of uncertainty because, you know, a lot of things will change because at some point the artists will just not get um, the same fees anymore because it's just impossible to do it. Um, and if the places are gone that, uh, you know, book the artists, then the scene is broken. And uh, this is, I think, in nobody's interest. So everybody will have to, um, will have to do their part in order to keep it, uh, to keep it running. Um, but I obviously do understand that um, certain realities, you know, people face and uh, standards uh, and expectations need to be met. But um, I think we need to uh, keep holding up the communication uh, amongst um, all the stakeholders that at the end are part of this um, well, once well-oiled machine, you know, that is uh, definitely right now um, uh, running a little bit out of rhythm. So uh, we certainly need to um, put it back on track. And this is going to be a challenge because um, it is a lot of factors. 
and it is a lot of stakeholders, and um, we need to have it all, you know, on site in, in the, like, you know, in, in our vision in order to make the right decisions. So I think one thing that really take questions. Yeah. We can, yeah. Are there any other questions out I there? I think there's someone. In the meantime. Behind you. Uh, just a question to you guys. Um, why do you guys think it's so necessary for things to go back to the way that they were? Yes, there are an awful lot of stakeholders, but like you've already highlighted, things have changed, some for the good, some for the bad. But is this just not the new world that we all now find ourselves and we have to, as companies, adapt and pivot rather than simply try and recreate what was? Totally, good question. And as Daniel already said, it's a catalyst and um, driving us faster into the new world, which is also coming up already. For example, uh, when I was in the conference now in Bavaria, there was, the, there was like one macro strategist from the German um, uh, Wirtschaft economy. Uh, economy. And he was telling us like the problem with finding new young people working in your venues will grow because we have a demographic problem. And it's just the beginning, and it's of course the catalyst is now uh, Corona. But um, we will have, we will face these problems in the next five, ten, twenty years, every year more. So um, I'm, I'm, I'm with you. I think it's not only. I think the the challenge is to see also the potentials in this, you know, and not always to look back and say the old days were the best. And now everything is shitty because that's what we hated about our grandparents. Um, <laughs> so don't like relive this situation, I'm totally with you. But also I think it's like also important to highlight as so fast Corona hit us, it destroyed a lot of potential, a lot of structures. Um, and I think we also have to, to make them visible. Yeah, I mean, um, even electronic payments, you know, like pay, paying with a, uh, with a credit card or a debit card in a club, that was at least for my values, that was like, oh, that's commercial, and that's not underground, and uh, and now it's literally like, you know, every third guest is asking for it, and I do get it, you know, it's kind of like um, this was also a catalyst. Uh, it might have come at some point anyway, um, but um, that it is now on 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 such a demand that it is the most normal thing that, for people to ask for now. Um, that I didn't see coming, but um, obviously. It is also important for us to embrace change, and um, because change is good, uh, usually. And Ch change is happening. <laughs> change is happening if we want it or not, and I think uh, it will be those um, uh, coming out on top that are able to adapt and to, to embrace change in the right way. Uh, you shouldn't lose your values. That is, I think, on the way, uh, the big challenge, and that is uh, very important, because at the end, you still want to be um, part of creating something beautiful and at the end it should be fun and uh, you shouldn't just um, um, you know um, bow down in front of um, you know certain things that challenge you too much uh, and and you shouldn't uh, you shouldn't be um, you know breaking your neck and 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 breaking your your concept or um, or suddenly change your program and um, or or change what you stand for because of you know whatever you just got to find ways to still, you know, um, to still make it up to your uh, principles and uh, to keep to keep the fun in the party. And if you if you go back like 20 years or something and you say, for example, why should now to phrase it a little harsh, why should we save the old world? Um, it's not like in the in the 90s in Berlin, we just search another new empty warehouse in the east and then we go in there and everything is fine. It's like people build their careers on it, people uh, have children, you know, it's like not the 18 years people doing, doing some parties and are financed by their parents, it's like most of my workers have children, they, they, have, to, um, they have to bring the money in and it depends on what we do, it's like, yeah, it what pays the rent and as you know, like the rent situation in Berlin is getting uh, harder and harder, uh, just a friend of mine told me, ah, I'm, I'm going to Berlin and I'm now searching for a flat and I was like, ha, ha, ha. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions out there? Um, I, it's not just a question. I just wanted to say thank you to Club Commission because I'm, I co-founded Barcelona Club, uh, Club Commission there. 
So it's a Commission Nocturna, and now we are in the council, so we made it to talk to the um, municipalities, and there's a lot of good reasons to not to give up, because we have a big challenge, as you said, with new generations, because they don't know what a club is, they, um, they've been binge drinking in the streets all these two years of pandemics, and they all saw that they were to be blamed, and it's not true, because they didn't have a place to go. And now, thanks to you again, um, I think that we are, we are going somewhere, and yeah. So We've got to get you. the kids off the street. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, but they, they start to speak the same language, and they are really seriously listening to us, and I think that we owe a lot to you, because we, we made this, um, well, a manifesto that everyone, every club, everyone is signing up, and I think that it's for any city who's pointing the same way, just uh, I want to push them to do it. Yep, that's all. Yeah, for us as, uh, as part of the club commission, it's always really nice to see because lots of people come to us and say it's like when they talk to their uh, officials in their cities, like for example Cologne or also other cities, they often point to us to like it's, it's possible in Berlin, why isn't it possible here? And I think this is also like the first step often into communications with the officials to get seen as a nightlife industry which brings um, working places, which brings taxes, which brings visibility also as a city. Uh, in Berlin we made in 2019 the Gold Media study, which showed that every third people or person coming to Berlin is coming because of the nightlife. And we make like 1.5 milliarden, which is like lots of money with all the side money coming in when you want to go to Berlin clubbing, because you need a taxi, you need a hotel, you need food. Uh, you go to a concert and whatever. And so it's like bringing in money into the system. And often that's what I realized with my, with my location, Klunkerkranich, as well. I was talking to the officials like years, and they were like, you're crazy people on the roof. And then I told them, we have, <laughs> yeah. And then I told them, we have 120 workers. We pay that and that much taxes. So many people coming to us. And then we're like, ah, come in. I have a date for you. Let's talk. Yeah, you know, and then you have to throw them with the numbers to get their attention, and then you come in with the quality things, things, and then you tell them how vibrant it can be to be in the middle of a dance floor, sweaty, uh, and uh, it's like really important that they see why we need those places, you know. Well, it's very important. Obviously, club, club culture is very important for the identity of, of of Berlin. I mean, it's it's clearly um, one of the yeah, one of the most significant uh, characteristics of the city and that has brought a lot to the city because um, Berlin was the biggest industrial city in the world before the World War. After, there is not a single um, uh, industrial headquarter anymore in Berlin. And um, so it's not an industrial city. It is obviously not a financial, um, you know, a hub. And it has basically its, its culture and its media that's that's about it, and now there's obviously a, a very fast growing um, a startup scene, and the startup scene obviously there's also reasons why you know why why the startups come here. Um, there's even companies that don't really want to come here, but they have to come because this is where the talents are, and the talents they you know look at the city, they're like, okay, I'm young, I want to have a nice work life balance, and um, you know I that's why I go to Berlin because clubbing is cool, there's bars. And um, I want to live in this, um, you know, crazy town, and therefore, then the the companies need to come because um, they are obviously looking for the talents, and they need the workers, they need the brain. And um, even though it is uh, certainly under high pressure, the brain in Berlin, <laughs> weekend challenges, but um, but uh, nevertheless, um, it is it is one of the major reasons why um, you know a lot of startups ch chose to uh, to come to Berlin. And um, there again, it is, um, you know, it is jobs, it is taxes, and it is development for the city. If that's a good one or a bad one is maybe a different discussion, but... We will see, <laughs> maybe in 20 years, like 20th BDME we are talking here about, why didn't we stop the startups like 20 years ago, you know? So how, how do you, well, I mean, we talked about another conversation together about San Francisco, for example, you know, how there's a huge startup scene there and, 
now there's a massive tech scene there, but in the 90s, San Francisco was kind of like the bastion for the underground music and rave scene. Um, so that's obviously changed a lot. So how do you think uh, Berlin is changing as a result? Yeah, we talked about it already. It's like it's harder and harder to find flats, for example. You know, you get people in who earn way more money than you earn normally in Berlin. And they say, for example, like 2,000 euro for a small flat with 50 square meters. No problem. That's cheap. Uh, was like I was living in London and I paid like 6,000 for this flat. No, no way. I can I can go clubbing every day. No, I have the money, you know. So you have the pressure on the on the market for for the for the flats, for example. And but also what I see is that we have uh, lots of spaces like outside the inner ring getting more and more attractive. You know, ours always outside of the inner inner ring. When, for example, this was started like 14 years ago now, everybody was like, who should go there? And now when you go there, you see a lot of people go there because they made their work well. They built a nice hub for people with culture and uh, nights where you can go crazy. Um, so you're like one point of interest where the people want to go. So I think it's always like, of course, we can be feared of what the what the startup money will do to our city. And I think we should and we should be aware and always like to talk about it and think and feel and um, to also to talk to the people. Um, for example, we are just trying to get a, there's like a prop tech house uh, company who are bringing all those like new startup millions people together because they want to uh, have exposure to the to the um, to the uh, market to buy to buy houses and such and to develop them. So we are now trying to get a, a date with them to talk to them um, about that. For example, when they buy a new house or build a new house, that they talk to us if they want to have a new space, also cultural space inside. Um, because this is, for example, a, a one history or one uh, one um, success from uh, the Club Commission Arbeitskreis Raum when the new RSO, Revier Südost, formerly known as Griesmühle, at the Bärenquell Bauerei, there were some developers who came to the, to the Club Commission and asked if they have some player in the scene who wants to go out there and to build a cultural place there. And so we could bring those two uh, parties together and now there's like growing a new space, which is like really awesome and really big. And I think it's the the thing where we have to be aware and bring the right people together and also if they are coming in not so right people to tell them about why they should change their behavior and maybe their way of thinking um, to keep the reason alive why they are coming to Berlin, you know? So yeah, how do you think uh, with, with the underground dance culture so big in Berlin, how can we adapt to be inclusive? Uh, like you were saying in Copenhagen, for example, this was sort of an issue. So. How do we keep those values in line and allow the city to change as it needs to? Yeah, the underground. I mean, defining the underground is really, uh, it, that's gotten in a little bit more difficult the past years. Because it's, um, I mean, yeah, it's, it's certainly not the underground that it used to be. And it's not so underground. It's probably also good because, you know, the safer the spaces are, the better for the safety of the people. Um, nevertheless, it is still safer spaces, you know, it's literally um, places where you can go and let loose and test your, you know, limits a little bit, see how your personality um, uh, uh, resonates with other people in, in a space like, um, you know, all of these things. Um, get to know yourself, you know, um, this I think clubbing um, is, is a big part of um, being able to help you. Um, finding, uh, finding, finding out who you are as a young individual. Um, yeah, I, I mean, as, as, as we said, it is important to adapt to changes and to also be part of the change, take the right to create also these changes, to, um, you know, to raise your hand and say, wait a minute, um, this and that value, equality, inclusion, equity uh, even more um you know this is important this is important accessibility all of these things are very important and um our scene has 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 been built on this uh, on 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 a lot of these values and it is okay to you know demand that from new stakeholders coming in and you know giving you potentially space uh, to do something when you're a big development company, and uh, but then you you know kind of tell them, look, um, 
if you ask me to pay this and that much rent, then I will have to do this and that, and this is not what it's about. Um, the values that we're thriving for is this and that, and uh, for this I need a little bit more room to breathe, also financially, and um, this way um, you have a base to talk to the people because they do understand it, because they want you to be there because of these values, you know, that because this is image um, and, 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 and real estate developers as well as um, other um, house owners or, or building uh, owners, equi um, 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 property owners, um, they are, you know, they also want you to come um, because of their space becoming more interesting and um, suddenly a place that was far out is suddenly much closer to the center, just in the head of the people, because this is what it's about. It's not about the actual distance in meters, it's about what do people think, how far it is. And if they um, you know, consider um, a certain spot to be closer to the center, then it is automatically worth more, and uh, worth more for the city also to develop infrastructure. Going there, you know, having having an having an U-Bahn or an S-Bahn potentially, um, and you know, coming more often, and um, things like this, and and other you know infrastructural um, things that help to 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 develop and grow the city, also into parts that have been underprivileged in the past. When you ask about how co how we can um, still stick with the old values, like of the Berlin underground scene, I think. Um, we don't have to care so much because when I was talking to a lot of young people in the last weeks and I got really big hopes on them because I realized that lots of them are really uh, focusing on if, for example, I, bu I buy a ticket for a festival when I have some people who, who play there I like, but also um, the topic of ecological sustainability, for example, do they have like plastic cups and just throw it away, then I go, don't go there because it doesn't... Um, react to my values. Also like the inclusivity, for example, for disabled people. Um, I think it's a way bigger topic than we old, white, privileged people think. And I think there, I have the hope that also like this Friday for Future activism brings way more consciousness to the topic. And of course, we still have some people who are just living in the Instagram scene and uh, photographing and filming everything and just bringing it online. But I think we have lots of potential in the young people, um, which we don't see, what, what, what I didn't see in the last years. And I think it's evolving and coming up. And when I was talking at this conference to some older actors of the cities, uh, of, the, of, the, um, of the scene, um, we realized if you don't adapt to this, if you are not accessible for disabled people, if you are not ecologically sustainable, socially sustainable, if you just book male artists, for example, no, you don't have in mind that there's something, a topic called gender equality or something, or uh, that you have minority people like BIPOC on stage, and um, then you will be out of the business in the next five or ten years. That's what I think and hope, you know? So it's also been a redefining of values. Um, so kind of keeping the, uh, you know, the silver lining in mind as we look forward, you know, what do you think some opportunities were that were found during the pandemic? And you know, as we look forward, how do we bring all this together so that we're actually better off than we were before? Um, I mean, one topic that we haven't, that you have just been uh, touching a little bit about is, um, you know, the di diversity um, a topic and um, the topic of awareness um, becoming really a very, a very um, huge um, topic during the pandemic. It was already, uh, you know, kind of there just before, but uh, we were, for example, talking about women in the business and in the, in the class of DJs um, uh, being, you know, underrepresented. And we didn't even talk about minorities at this at this point. We, I mean, the broader scene. So it was more about like male, female, and um, that we have widened this discussion was so important and is uh, was so necessary and long overdue. And um, so that all of these um, you know discussions that were also held in in in, in aggressive ways and partly even militant ways. I really hope that we. Um, can uh, go back to talking to one another in person also, within the scene, in the institutions of our scene, the clubs, 
and um, and not fight on on the internet, you know, in in an anonymous way, and like you know, getting out uh, um, the pitchfork and uh, the torch, and like you know, okay, who are we gonna murder next? <laughs> so and um, and this is really not the way, I think, and it is important to 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 exchange, discuss uh, transparently and openly, but it is also important to be friendly and respectful, and to actually solve the issues and, and, and not just you know, hate on one another. I do think that the scene at the moment is very sensitive and everybody fears to be you know, uh, the, next, um, the next cancel attack um, uh, a target. And I, I really hope that this time that has been so challenging for a lot of people and that has been in, in a way a little bit aggressive will like is at the end in a bigger picture just the time of growth when it hurts because for change it has to hurt also it cannot all go smoothly i do understand that and i really hope that this is not the beginning of the worst but the beginning of the better and um and this i i really i really hope for and i do see a silver lining in that because the things that we have been discussing very actively are being put in place I really hope that they are sustainably put in place and not, you know, gone in five years, and that the support for, you know, all the the, the groups that we have been mentioning um, will be kept up and will just become the most normal thing in the world, um, which it is to a lot of places, um, but uh, not to all. So um, this, I would say, is maybe a silver lining that um, that you know these things we went we went through it now. And I really hope uh, that we can uh, uh, come back together in a in a more um, you know in a, in a friendlier way and 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 yeah, bring the fun back to the party. I think it's always what you what you make out of it, and um, if you see something like potential and you focus focus on it, then you can make and grow something out of this shit we just had the last two years. Um, for me, for example, I think I see more and more, and I make it also on my personal focus, to be more loving, kindness, constructive, productive, and to embrace people who think like that, so that you care more for each other, that you think about who you book, that you think about how you treat your guests. It's not about like standing in line, no, not today. <laughs> uh, which is, I don't think that's uh, the, the, I don't think that's the clubbing, that's the future of clubbing. I don't think so, I don't think so. I have the hope that it's getting more focused on the humans, more focused on the art, um, and that also rooms and organizers develop into the next area or like the next stage of doing events and um, when I talked to those young people it was like really I was like short before crying because of joy because I saw like you have so it's so much more than the big artists you want to see it's like the whole construct of a festival of a club it's like a it's a it's a it's, it's a special room which is not only the artists um, and it's like how you treat people and it's like more of a social construct which is getting bigger and bigger especially when you were sitting two years in front of your TV watching every show on Netflix you see it's important to bring people together uh, like in a warm and what I what I say like caring way um, and I think this is what people missed a lot and what you what you saw in the pandemic that the internet is not giving you this in a, in a whole situation. Um, and of course, for example, we saw that digital rooms and digital stages are way more capable of that we thought about it before. Um, coming up some, some things like metaverse and possibilities who we may be, um, we may go into the future and have some way new situations, how present art and uh, how to be human. But for the beginning, for me, it's like really nice to see that people come together and have nice moments and uh, vibrant ideas and experiences together as a community. And yeah, I, I, I love it to see people coming back again and especially at our location, for example, I see so many smiling people and they enjoy it to go out there again. And I see that a lot of people, for example, say, of course, we now we have to pay a little bit more entrance, a little bit more for the beer, but we support this because we want to keep this alive because we love it and it gives us a kind of to be of a sense of use, uh, like this, I feel human inside of this, you know, and I think this is like a really big thing we should focus on to be more 
um, positive. Yeah, at the end of the day, I think it's taught us how important it is to have a community, the importance of human connection, and on a grander scale, our innate oneness. So hopefully we can take that to better places. Um, any questions out there? I have, uh, can you hear me? <clears throat> yes, very I have well. more of an observation than a question, really, but um, what I've noticed after the pandemic, so, well, before the pandemic, I, I've been going out for a long time, so uh, before the pandemic, you show up with a ticket at a club, and generally there's a separate line, and you're in pretty quickly. And what I've noticed after the pandemic is with the, um, you know, you had to show the proof of the vaccination, and then you had to show a, a corona test, and they had to match it to your ID. So there was one massive queue forming, and then everyone was waiting in that line. And it happened to me. I heard other people saying, you know, oh, the line is so long. Uh, why bother with this, you know? So I think also the, um, the model needs to be looked at with many of the clubs. Um, I was at one, uh, Revier Zudost, last weekend with a pre-sale ticket. And a friend of mine had come in from Munich. And we waited in line for two hours and ten minutes with a pre-sale ticket. And both of our tickets were rejected and uh, were told to leave. And um, two people were accepted for cash uh, right in front of us beforehand. And it um, wasn't really the best experience. And um, those people waiting in line forever with a pre-sale ticket, I mean, who's going to come back, you know? So um, I, I see some adjustments. In, you know, I don't know what's causing all of this, really. But um, I mean, it was much easier to go out before the pandemic uh, from a, a queuing perspective. And I think there's been a change that's happened. And it really hasn't, uh, I, I can't say it's ever going to go back exactly the way it was. But, but it's uh, a change, and it hasn't really realigned with that. And it's, it's not a pleasant experience for a lot of people going out. So maybe this has something to do with why the people aren't going back. If they <clears throat> are standing in line so long, they're exhausted by the time they get into the club. Um, maybe they don't want to go the next time. You know, I mean, that's kind of the way I felt with this club. I feel like I never want to go back there again in my entire life. It's done over with. But, you know. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Lost and, some customers. <laughs> Yeah, Obviously, so, uh, <laughs> but you know, I don't want to be too negative about it. I mean, I I, I love the nightclubs in Berlin, and uh, I have my favorites, and and I get into most of them without any problem. But I've never in my life had a pre-sale ticket rejected at a club. That was a first for me, and also for my friend. So, um, and maybe a grievance procedure. If people have problems like this, what do they do? You know, um, some of them leave one-star reviews on Google, which doesn't make the club look very good. And uh, there's quite a few out there, really. So. Um, you know, <clears throat> just a little bit of feedback. But overall, I appreciate the conversation. And uh, I do also think that the clubs are just getting back into motion again. And I compared it to like a clock. If you have a clock and it's been ticking for years and years and it stops for two years and it starts up again, you know, you have to add some oil and the gears are a little bit off and, and it's going to take some time, I think, to get it going again. And uh, I appreciate everyone's efforts with it. Thanks. Any other questions? Thank you. Yeah, first, guys, thank you for the amazing panel. Um, I have two questions, actually. Um, first one, as you're you know, working for the benefit of the artists, and you as a, as a club owner as well, have you ever considered tapping into the um, royalties payment side of things? You know, you have to pay, I'm sure, immense license fees to GEMA. And I'm sure it must be you know, frustrating that they don't get paid out to the artists. And there's been a lot of um, initiatives to get some MRT technology installed and so on, but we get pushbacks from GEMA all the time. So I was wondering if, as club commission, if you feel like you have the power to you know, either make it mandatory or use some of the subsidies you get to get that sort of equipment installed. And the second question was, did I understand correctly that Grismule is then not getting demolished and built into a parking lot? <laughs> well, the Grismule um, premises has already a new building on it. Okay. Yeah. It's already yeah. demolished, the old one. It's not a parking lot, no. So it's an art uh, No, no, no. Like, it's like the, the, the one in uh, Neukölln. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's already a new building, is already shaping there. Okay. I mean, I guess it also has a parking lot, but <laughs> it's not just the parking lot. Um, for the first uh, the MRT topic, uh, my publisher Hermann sits here in the audience and he's always like deeply into the topic and we also have some forces inside a club commission 
who made this also a topic already. But as often as we are, for example, uh, faced with problems of the cultural activists in the city, we can't handle everything and also not as fast as we want to do and we have not the funding we would like to have. Um, so for us, it's, it is a topic. We want to see it more and more getting into Germany. Um, because I think also when I talk to Hermann, it's like uh, lots of um, countries in the world are so way far than with a topic than us. And we have the system with the GEMA where you don't, where you collect the money, but you can't really say who played what, and then the old big ones get it. And it's like really a distribution of money to the, like in the worst way you can imagine. Um, I think I just got my last uh, GEMA um, uh, uh, slip. slip and it was like, oh my God. <laughs> and um, yeah, of course we have to, we have to go into those topics, but it's also like, that's where I always, always talking to everybody is like, um, the more people we are, the more people who put in their work into the scene to make it visible, to talk to people, to engage, um, the faster we can go forward. It's, um, we, we see a lot of things in the last weeks which um, don't work correctly in the city and everybody's talking like, ah, Club Commission, can you please change this? And we are always like, we can only do that and that and we have not unlimited capacities. We are quite a big Club Commission um, to, in, in comparison to the other ones in the, in the, in the, in the country or in the, in the world, but we are still small. And that's why we always work on new fundings so we can have more force to um, bring the scene um, like in front and uh, yeah, to do that. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, uh, going against GEMA is just really, really difficult. A multi-million euro organization um, that has ties up to the highest um, you know, uh, ranks of the government. And partly for good reason, but um, obviously I also do think that this organization needs to be reformed. They did try um, also to reform the fees for the clubs. I don't know if you've heard, it was quite some, some years ago, and that would have added like a six-digit amount of fees per year on clubs like Berghain. And um, we were able to actually stop that as a club commission. I wasn't part of it, but the club commission was you know, getting everybody on the table and um, and this this um, did not come because that would have had like a like a very terrible effect and that could have literally um, yeah uh, uh, ruined a few um, of the places so we were happy to actually you know accomplish that rather than actually you know taking from them on top of it um, so that will definitely take a lot of efforts and ongoing efforts and infiltration uh, techniques potentially to actually have these um, boxes, you know, installed in the right places because the GEMA does have, uh, you know, these um, these boxes, um, you know, to, to, to check what, what music is being played and this is how they kind of scale, at least this is how it was a few years ago. But this is not repre uh, representational, you know. In, in Berlin, techno is literally mainstream, and but these boxes don't hang in the mainstream uh, uh, clubs. They hang in like some weird places um, where you would really not listen to the music of Robin. And um, so, yeah, that's that's definitely its own challenge, and um, it will definitely also take. Um, yeah, I've, uh, a lot of smart people with a lot of. Uh, lobby power, but not just the club commission. That's uh, we're literally too small for that. Then um, and and also this is you know it's more of an artist kind of thing. It's you know like the or the, yeah the club. Owner, I mean we pay the fee and it's kind of like yeah we would love it to go to the artists, but we will have to pay anyway. And obviously we would love to pay it to the people that actually play in our clubs, of course. But, um, you know, we have other fights to fight at the moment. <laughs> um, and it's, it's, not, it's not all the way on top of the agenda, even though it is clearly, you know, this is what we would prefer um, to be um, paid, uh, yeah, to have a, a complete new um, payout structure on this end. But um, it's also important that the labels push for that, that the artists, um, you know, uh, group up and, 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 and you know, uh, work out their force because they are the ones that are affected, because they literally don't earn the money that they should. But you should never forget, if you form like this group of people, bring people together to, to, to talk in like one bigger voice, 
then uh, the chance gets higher and higher that you change something in the world. So I want to embrace you, like if you're into this topic, go out to talk to the people, um, bring people together, and maybe we can change it in the next years. It should be changed, you're totally right. The Berlin Music, what is it called? Our sister organization. Music Commission. Yeah, the BMC. Berlin BMC, Berlin Music Commission. It's actually a little bit more, it's like our sister um, uh, association. And uh, they are a bit closer on these topics. They also work closer with uh, GEMA, as a matter of fact, and they do have people that are literally able to whisper to them. So, and I think this is this is <laughs> this is kind of like the strategies and techniques uh, how to um, how to how to kind of like uh, change a giant like that. I think we have just time for one, one more question. Just one one more question in the back. Yeah. I, I don't have a question. I actually want to add something, but um, I think the question is more important, so please. <laughs> <laughs> well, you have the mic. We'll give you 30 seconds. <laughs> um, hi. I thought it was really interesting when you guys were talking. I noticed that you're already working with a lot of strengths, that you have a really strong community. Um, but I wasn't sure if you have like a monthly meeting, like a forum or a plebiscite where people like, like us can bring topics to your table and or maybe you have topics that people could in the community could support you with. Um, and if you, if you ever utilize technology to facilitate some of these types of meetings, in the industry that I work in, it's become very interesting, like the virtual meetings and gathering stuff. It's, it's actually really cool, I'm not gonna lie. But do you see anything like that in your future? I don't know. Well, with the Club Commission, we have a, um, a regular newsletter where, you, where we inform all the people about what we do. And if someone is interested, the people can contact us, of course. Um, and we have regular meetings, but more or less um, like in smaller structures, like not the Berlin Club Commission meets up and talks about everything because maybe you can imagine we have so many topics, it's like really a bunch full of topics and work. So what we do is like we have those Arbeitskreise or Arbeitsgruppen, AGs, and um, they have regular meetups. And then we, for example, we also made like a call, a digital call um, with um, some lawyer regarding the Kurzarbeitergeld. Uh, for all the people who are f feared that they pay, that they had like the wrong um, amount of money, so they have to pay it back. So they, we talked, we organized something that we have a lawyer who's really into the topic, talk to everybody. Then you have open question rounds and such. So we have it in a little um, broke breakdown to all the topics. So it's like not the main meeting. That's what we do as a board, uh, as members of the board, of course, every month and talk about it. Um, but we have not like one um, big uh, meeting where everybody can attend. But I think we are quite accessible for everybody. Um, you can, we have like a good communication work. You can write us on Facebook, uh, via email, on Instagram. We reply, um, we hear you and uh, we do our best. But of course we still can get better and that's where I'll come back again to embrace you, to come to us, to help us, to work with us. Um, so we get like the club commission um, still evolving to a better organization for club culture and the people and the needs of the people. All right, thank you all for being here. My name is Galestian, Robin Schellenberg, Daniel Plosch. Thank you. Thank you.